Hi, I'm Eric Anzalone, and this is What Matters Most. Today we're at Princeton TV Studios in Princeton, New Jersey. And have you ever considered where your food really comes from when you're browsing the aisles of your supermarket? Do you ever wonder who really controls our food supply? The public, government, farmers, corporations? Over the past 30 years, I believe we've lost a connection, a reverence to what sustains us, food grown and harvested from the bounty of Mother Earth. But fortunately, the public is waking up and taking responsibility for its health, reclaiming that connection. There's still a lot of work to do, though, and some would say we even need a revolution. Do you hear the people sing? No lame is, sorry, Andras. Yeah, I'm a theater geek. I'm not talking about that kind of revolution. I'm talking about a food revolution. And I think I know just the man to talk to. via the wondrous worldwide and the fabulousness of Skype. My guest today from Santa Cruz, California is transformational social change leader, Ocean Robbins. Ocean is co-founder and CEO of the Food Revolution Network, which boasts over 100,000 members. He's an adjunct professor of peace studies at Chapman University and co-author of the book, Voices of the Food Revolution. At 16, he founded Youth for Environmental Sanity, and directed the organization for 20 years. Now, I don't know about you, but at 16, my focus was not the environment, and sanity is a work in progress. This guy is the real deal, and he has been for a very long time. Ocean Robbins, welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, you're renowned around the world. You've been recognized for your work, uh, a recipient of the Freedom Flame Award, uh, the Jefferson Award for Outstanding Public Service. It, it tell us, you know, you refer to yourself as a transformational social change leader. Can you define that? <laughs> well, transformation to me is a big and important word because it's about not just trying to win a kind of right-left political battle. It's about trying to change the game so mm -hmm. that it's not about defeating somebody. It's about creating a win-win solution where everybody evolves. We are in a situation on this planet right now where human beings are going to have to evolve in some pretty fundamental ways. If civilization as we know it is going to survive into the future, mm. we have more and more people on this planet, but the planet's not getting any bigger. Mm. We're using up more and more of our forests, our water, our minerals. We're producing more and more pollution and toxic waste. And the simple reality is, if you just look at the basic mathematics of it with climate change and all the other issues we face today, that we're only going to survive and prosper into the future if we can have some transformations in consciousness as well as in conduct. We're gonna have to learn how to make war obsolete. We're gonna have to learn how to live in right relationship with each other and with the differences. This is a more and more interconnected, interdependent world. And with the spread of nuclear weapons and chemical weapons, you know, the, the reality is that we're going to have to evolve into a more harmonious and cooperative way of being on this planet if we're going to make it. Yeah. So that's why I say transformation. And I think social change is all about how do we create change in our society that helps us thrive. Exactly. And your mantra is uh, helping people to awaken to who they, they truly are. Now, I've, I've read this in a lot of self-help books. I've been told this by many therapists, you know, find out who you really are. Uh, how, what's your take on that? And how would a person begin to awaken who they truly are? Well, we have this myth, I think, that how we feel and what we do is a response to or a product of what happens to us. And a lot of times we spend time in therapy and we tell our therapists about all the awful things that happened in our childhood and all the ways that it's devastated our lives. But I think that what's missing in that is that we have choice. We actually are the authors of our own lives to a very great extent. We're not just passive victims of what happens to us or products of the world around us. Now, if we were just products of what happened to us, then I think humanity would be kind of doomed because the past cannot equal the future if we want to have a thriving future. 
But here's the wonderful thing. I think we actually have the capacity to make choice about how we feel, about how we respond to what happens in our lives. Mm. And that choice, I think, carries within it the hope of the world. Speaking of choice, uh, I chose at the age of 15 uh, to take my first job scooping ice cream at Baskin Robbins in Santa Barbara, California. True. This is true. Uh, now, can you tell everyone who your grandfather is and the choice that your father made that completely changed everything? My grandfather was Irvin Robbins, and he was the founder with his brother-in-law, Bert Baskin, of a little ice cream company called <laughs> Baskin Robbins. And my dad grew up with an ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool in the backyard. He had 31 flavors of ice cream in the freezer at all times, and he was groomed with every expectation that he would one day join in his father in running the family company. Mm -hmm. But as my dad got a little older, he ended up feeling called in a different direction. So when he was in his early 20s and he was offered that opportunity, he said no. And he walked away from huge amounts of fame and fortune. It was a path that was practically paved with gold and ice cream. <laughs> and it, he chose instead to follow his own rocky road. Oh, yeah. He, <laughs> he, and he walked away from this, this, this uh, ice cream fortune because he wanted to uh, dedicate his life to something other than selling ice cream. He ended up moving with my mom to a little island off the coast of Canada where they built a one-room log cabin, grew most of their own food, and lived very, very simply. And I was born in that cabin to parents who were practicing yoga and meditation for several hours per day and naming their kid Ocean. That's me. <laughs> I grew up in a certain way uh, far away from a lot of the world. You know, I was in the middle of the woods. But I grew up feeling loved and in some ways feeling very connected to the world. I, felt, I knew where my food came from because mm. we grew it ourselves. Mm. I felt connected to the seasons. I felt connected to nature. Then when I got a little older, we moved to California. And my dad began work on a book called Diet for a New America, which came out in 1987. It became this runaway bestseller. And the media had a lot of fun with my dad's story. They called him the rebel without a cone. <laughs> now, here's this guy, this would-be ice cream heir, who walks away from this huge family fortune to dedicate his life to educating people about healthy food choices, which is what my dad was doing. And we received tens of thousands of letters from readers thanking my dad for changing their lives, and many of them saying he felt, they felt like he'd saved their lives. And that's when it really occurred to me in this deep way that any human being can make a difference. You know, most people would have thought that my dad, when he walked away from Baskin Robbins, was giving up on his chance to be a person of fame and substance in the world, to become some kind of a hippie. Mm. But instead, he ended up making an even bigger difference because he followed his conscience. Mm. He followed his own star, if you will, and ended up changing, you know, millions of lives. And you followed in your father's footsteps, and together, you and your father, John, created the Food uh, Revolution Summit. Can you explain to us a little bit about that? Well, absolutely. And I'll say first that I uh, founded a nonprofit organization when I was 16 that I directed for 20 years called Youth for Environmental Sanity, or YES. And we reached more than 650,000 students in schools and uh, live events, reaching um, leaders in over 65 countries. And the goal of YES was really to empower young people with the knowledge about the choices we make and how we can use our lives and our choices to take a positive action and make a positive impact in the world. Uh, after 20 years of directing YES, I was very inspired by the power of the next generation, but I also kept thinking food is really so pivotal. So I decided I, just, I wanted to move on from that to working directly with my dad. Two years ago, we launched the Food Revolution Network. And that's grown into a network of more than 125,000 people who are taking action for healthy, sustainable, humane, and conscious food. We work primarily online. We uh, interview and share the wisdom of some of the top food revolutionary experts on the planet. And we distill their wisdom through books like our book, Voices of the Food Revolution, which is in bookstores nationwide, mm -hmm. um, through our summits, we organize online telesummits, and through our emails, which go out every couple of, every couple of days, just sharing tools, insights, inspiration to really help folks take action. And I gotta tell you, I'm so excited about food, <laughs> about the power that food represents. And, and there really does seem to be a disconnection from what we perceive to be as real food, what is grown on the farm, 
and what we eat. You ask somebody, what is macaroni and cheese to you? And they're going to think of Kraft, okay? Which probably has nothing real in it. No, you know, uh, sorry, Kraft foods. But for, I mean, in all intents and purposes. Uh, how do we find our way back to what is the real meaning of food? Mm, great question. Well, you know, the, the wonderful thing about the food revolution is that wherever you are in your food journey, you can take steps in a positive direction. And you don't have to go all the way to some pure, purity. You don't have to sign a purity pact in order to be a food revolutionary. But you can take steps. And the great thing is that every step you take builds momentum. And the next step gets easier. And what matters most isn't what you eat at any one given meal. It's the habits that you form day in and day out that change the shape of your destiny. Mm. And so the way you can get back to real food is by looking at labels. Read those labels. The most important part of a package is not the front of the package. It's the, it's the nutrition and, and ingredient list on the back of the package. And if you see ingredients in that list that you do not know what they are and recognize them, then the odds are there's some kind of chemical that came from a laboratory, not some kind of food that grew on a farm. And if you see that, you can know this may not be real food. But we are eating a vast amount of chemicals, food additives, hormones, antibiotics, highly refined products that our great grandparents would never have even recognized as food. And they've come into the food supply often inadequately tested. And we are seeing an epidemic rise in all kinds of food ailments right now and health ailments right now that are making us sick. We have more people sick in the United States today than any population that we know of in the history of the world. People who are living chronically ill and in pain. And the great thing is that it doesn't have to be that way. Mm. We know how to reverse most of our chronic ailments just with a healthier diet. Okay, then in a nutshell, or if you could really condense it, what are the top foods you think we should avoid? Oh, we got, we got to eat less sugar, less refined carbohydrates, less fried foods, less animal products, especially animal products that come from factory farms. And honestly, I think we got to get away from genetically modified organisms, or at least everyone needs to make an informed choice about that. Mm. Um, so those are some of the top things. And, and I, I want to encourage folks to eat more vegetables. There is just no way around it. The more vegetables you eat, the better. They are a, they are a nutrient powerhouse. <laughs> and... and you know, think about nutrient density, the relationship between nutrients and calories. You want the highest nutrient to calorie ratio possible. And if you can get there, then your, your body will feel fed and nourished with less calories. And then you'll be healthier. Okay, so the next question. Superfoods. Can you think of three superfoods? You know, we hear this label thrown around. Oh, it's a superfood. Can you give us an example of a couple of those? Well, some of my favorites, my top number one superfood is kale. I mean, there's just no way around it. Love All kale. of the Brassica family, kale, collards, and cabbage are spectacular superfoods. They don't cost a ton, so you don't see them touted as superfoods because mm -hmm. no one can make a lot of money selling them. But if you actually want to look at what you're getting per pound of food, there's just no way around it. Those are superstars. And then another superfood would be chia seeds. They haven't gotten nearly as much attention. Ch -ch 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 chia <laughs> Chia, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and there's a lot of great things. You know, you soak them with some, some fruit juice, a little sweetener, some berries. You can make an amazing pudding. You know, chia seeds are just so rich in nutrients. And you get, you get some great protein. You get omega-3 fatty acids. They digest well, unlike flax seeds. So mm. chia seeds, kale, and the whole, of the whole um, brassica family are superstars. And then I honestly think mushrooms are pretty awesome. Um, not necessarily button mushrooms, but there's a lot of other kinds of mushrooms that are out there. You know, they can get a little pricey, but if you think about it in terms of what you're actually getting, you know, what does it cost to go to the hospital? What does it cost to, to be not fully at your best day in and day out at work? What does it cost when you can't get a good night's sleep for a month and you lose your job because you can't show up well at work? Mm -hmm. If you think about it in those terms, sp spending a few bucks for some nice healthy mushrooms looks like nothing. Yeah. Okay, now, to err is human. Come on, you got to cheat somewhere. Well, I mean, is there a vice that you have? I mean, first off, you, you're Baskin Robbins. I mean, you know, peanut butter and chocolate was one of my favorite flavors. I mean, is there, is there somewhere, can you just be human for a second and tell us where you might cheat? <laughs> my, I'll just tell you first. My dad invented Jamocha Almond Fudge when he was in elementary yes. school. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so if you're, if you're gonna eat one Baskin Robbins flavor, that's probably okay. the first thing to go Absolutely. for. Absolutely, <laughs> I have to agree. Oh, with you. My, my my biggest vice is probably gonna be uh, chocolate. Okay. You know, I just happen to love chocolate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will say, though, that I love organic fair trade chocolate. Well, I was going to say, there are good <laughs> chocolates out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I also have a little thing for, uh, you know, for coffee. And I don't drink gallons of it. But my okay. goodness, some fair trade shade growing coffee, you know, uh, the right time of day. Yeah. Yeah, I hear <laughs> it's a you. nice thing. I'm with you, brother. Uh, now, on to GMOs. I'm sure a lot of people who watch our program are already familiar with GMOs, but how about you break it down for us? All right. Well, what is a GMO? A lot of people think it means God move over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it stands for genetically modified organisms. And a GMO is when the scientists have basically taken the DNA of one plant or one species, and they, they have modified it with the DNA from something completely foreign to create some new trait that they're looking to create in it. And Monsanto is the company that's been the biggest driving force behind GMOs. And they and their uh, allies have been telling the world for decades that GMOs were going to produce crops that would help feed a hungry world. They produce higher yields. They'd be more drought resistant. Uh, they'd offer a better nutritional profile. And uh, they'd be more disease resistant and reduce pesticide use. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to tell you that they have failed to deliver on any of those promises. When you actually look at what is on the market, and now 75% of the foods in our supermarkets or on our restaurant menus in the United States contain genetically modified organisms. So that we've, we've gotten quite far downstream with this experiment. When you look at what's actually on the market, it, none of it is reducing pesticide use. None of it is producing higher yields. None of it is producing better nutritional profile or better tasting foods. What we've got is two traits. Okay? Trait number one is herbicide resistance. So these are plants that now farmers can spray herbicides all over the field from airplanes, and they'll kill most of the weeds, but the plant will survive. This is great for Monsanto because they happen to sell the herbicide as well, Roundup, right? So they've been selling massive amounts of Roundup, and we're pouring that on our fields, and we're contaminating our ecosystems. And now we've got super weeds that are resistant to it. Sure. So the next answer is 2,4-D. This is another kind of herbicide, and we've now got a whole generation of 2,4-D-resistant crops. Now, 2,4-D is a very toxic substance. It was used as half of Agent Orange in Vietnam. It's been linked to more than a million birth defects. And we are on the verge now of pouring this on our cropland across America. Wow. Yeah. So the other trait that's been put into these GMOs is the Bt toxin in every cell of the plant. Bt is an insecticide. Bugs eat it, their stomachs split open and they die. It's generally considered fairly non-toxic, but we are now producing plants that are living pesticide fact factories. They're registered with the EPA as pesticides. And this is not something you can wash off. It's in every cell of the plant. So we're consuming massive amounts of Roundup and Bt Right. So, I mean, even if you were consciously trying to eat non-GMO foods, the fact is you're probably consuming it every day or, or it's, at some point during a week it's, you're, it's entering your system. So, right? This is not something you can completely avoid unless you're necessarily growing your own food or... or well, now let's get to the, G, the GMO labeling campaign and the right to yeah. know. You actually, you actually can avoid it, and I do. I don't eat GMOs. Okay. Uh, and there's, there's a, it's a three-step process for how you avoid it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So step number one is organic foods are non-GMO. So anything that's certified organic, by definition, can, isn't GMO. Step number two, you go for non-GMO certified products. Those are products that may not be organic, but they're certified, third-party verified, non-GMO. Okay. Step number three, you read labels and you pay attention because pretty much all of the GMOs are for crops at this point that are in our food supply. Mm -hmm. There's a few other little bits, but basically we're talking about soy, we're talking about corn, we're talking about canola, which is in canola oil, and we're talking about sugar beets, which are used in sugar if it isn't cane sugar. So if you just look at corn, soy, canola, and sugar... And you say, okay, if I'm going to consume any of those four products, it, I want it to be organic or verified non-GMO, then you can read labels and you can actually do pretty well. Yeah, but, uh, you know, this brings up a couple questions. One, 
Is there an actual agency that is certified to do this GMO labeling? I mean, I don't know if the FDA is getting involved with this because, you know, they, they might not be 100 percent on board. Uh, and um, two, just like the whole fat free craze or gluten free craze, it just seems like now it's become a marketing campaign. Ooh, if we put non GMO on this, people are going to buy it, you know, and then I mean, I even heard that Cheerios is going to be coming out with a non gm I mean, that's, that's kind of an oxymoron, non-GMO Cheerios, because I think a Cheerios is junk food, basically. Um, yeah. I mean, so explain how, who, who, who controls this, and how do we know for real it's not a marketing point? It's the fastest growing market in the food sector, it's certified non-GMO foods. It's gone from zero to $3.4 billion in sales in the last two years. And the certification is done by the Non-GMO Project, which is a nonprofit organization that is quite credible, and they are tr truly out in the public interest. And they're the only official certifying third-party certifying agency that there is right now, and they are exploding because they can hardly keep up with the demand. So many folks will want to get certified. What we're seeing is that when companies put Non-GMO certified on their packages, Whole Foods markets have said that sales have gone up about 20% for the same product, mm -hmm. uh, just with that label on there. Now, the danger, of course, I think, is that people will think it means more than it does. They'll think that when they see that logo, that it, it means the same thing as organic, which it doesn't. Just because it's certified non-GMO doesn't mean it was grown without pesticides, doesn't mean the farm workers were treated decently, doesn't mean there aren't hormones or antibiotics in the meat products. It just means that there's no GMOs in there. So it's an important thing, but I don't think it's the whole story. Um, now, uh, I will say also that uh, the FDA is definitely kind of out to lunch on this issue. Michael Taylor, the guy who's responsible for, for overseeing the FDA policy on uh, GMO regulation, is a former vice president of Monsanto. Now, this, we, we literally have the, the fox guarding the hen house when it comes to GMOs. The agency that's responsible for the public welfare on this issue is looking out not for the public welfare, but for the corporate welfare. Mm. Yeah, Mon Satan's got their hand in everything. <laughs> but do, do you think that the people that work for Monsanto uh, eat GMO foods and don't think anything of it? Or are they like, eh, I think I'll just pass on this, you know? I, I, I could see them getting in trouble from their bosses for, for not eating their Kraft macaroni and cheese. Sorry, Kraft, I'm not throwing you under the bus, I swear. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean... Yeah, don't, do you think that they, these people are actually eating the food? I don't know what they eat. You know, I, there have been a lot of uh, internet buzz stories saying Monsanto serves all organic food in their cafeteria. Um, Monsanto denies that. Uh, I've never eaten in the Monsanto cafeteria myself, so I can't, I can't say one way or the other. Uh, there's no question that a lot of the people who are involved in the biotech industry genuinely believe that their products are safe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of science on the issue. And honestly, it's quite controversial. Uh, there is clearly not a consensus among scientists that GMOs are safe, despite the fact that many industry leaders are trying to tell us that it's that the case is closed. We have seen a lot of alarming studies. Most of them, actually, all of them have been conducted by independent scientists. Whenever a scientist is on the payroll of the biotech industry, for some funny reason, their studies always seem to say that GMOs are completely safe. But the rest of the time, when independent scientists study the issue, about a third of the time, they come back with fairly alarming data. Hmm. How, how are the, uh, the, the grocery, um, the GMA, uh, who, uh, when I read it, I thought, good morning, America. I thought, good morning, America is involved in this? Uh, the <laughs> Grocery Manufacturers Association. Um, how are they involved in this deception? First, what is GMA? Well, the Grocery Manufacturers Association is a consortium of uh, the junk food industry, to put it frankly. It's, it's your beloved craft. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the companies that are selling the stuff that's making a lot of money in our supermarkets. And for the most part, it's candy and soda and fried and highly processed foods, because honestly, that's where a lot of the money is getting made right now. That's, mm. what, that's what we're spending our money on. Mm. Um, so these folks are looking out for their interests. They want to preserve their market share. And they find that it's a little bit cheaper for them to buy genetically modified ingredients than not. And they would rather not put labels on their packages that say they contain GMOs. Mm. In Europe, uh, and other, which is among the 64 nations 
that uh, do mandate GMO labeling around the world, we find that consumers shy away from a product if it says that it contains GMOs. As a result, these folk companies have all uh, reformulated their products. So when they're selling to the European market, they don't include GMOs because it would be bad for business. Yeah. So they're afraid of having to do that here. Although there are folks who are saying, look, it would be good for trade because you wouldn't have to have two separate packaging plants, two separate processing plants. You can make the same stuff for Europe as you do for the US. But right now, as it stands, they think they would have to spend a little more money. You know, if Coca-Cola wants to get their high fructose corn syrup for their Coke, they might have to spend a little bit more money if it's coming from non-GMO sources. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, the dilemma. So they decided to put massive amounts of money into fighting GMO labeling. And the Grocery Manufacturers Association actually waged a covert campaign. They, in Washington, when there was a labeling initiative in the ballot last November, they actually um, raised money, uh, $22 million, from the junk food industry. Um, and they tried to hide the donors because Coca-Cola and Smuckers and the others involved were afraid of a consumer backlash if folks knew that these companies were trying to keep us in the dark about what we're eating. So they tried to hide it through the GMA and the, a, a lawsuit from the state attorney general said this is against the law, you've got to reveal who your donors were so the truth came out. And now there are active boycotts going on against Coca-Cola, which we've been launching. If you go to cokeboycott.com, you can find out all about it. We're trying to expose not just them, but the natural brands they own, like Honest Tea and Adwala, which are actually um, owned by Coca-Cola. You were part of a campaign to, against Coca-Cola uh, because of their over $1 million contribution to support GMO, right? Yeah. Right. yeah or, or I would say their contribution was to fight GMO labeling. And we're saying, you know what? Your company is profiting from the sale of natural foods. You know, yeah. you're making a lot of money selling Honest Tea and Adwala and vitamin water. And, you know, if you're going to profit from the natural foods consumers, then you ought to be accountable to the natural foods consumers who, for the most part, care what we put in our bodies. Yeah, I have to tell you, I, you know, I go to health food stores. I go, you know, where I see Odwala all the time. And to me, you know, maybe because of their brand, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, they're a natural kind of yochi, crunchy granola company. I like it. Turns out, yeah, no, it's Coca-Cola, right? Yeah. Right. Branding yeah. is everything in the 21st it century. It is, and, and Pepsi-Cola owns Naked Juice and, and just got sued for putting the word natural on their label while they included all kinds of unnatural substances, yeah. and now they've taken the word natural off. It's no longer appearing I on I love Naked that juice. green stuff that they make. That, yeah. Oh, my God, I just learned something. Now I can't buy that anymore. <laughs> um, now, Hawaii recently passed a bill on uh, labeling GMOs. Um, do you think that the movement will now pick up in the rest of the United States? Like you said, other countries around the world are already on board with this. And uh, well, you the, think Hawaii the island will... of Hawaii and the island of Kauai have both passed laws on those islands that actually relate to the growing of GMOs on those islands. I see. And they're restricting it so that folks can't grow GMO crops without going to more process around it or in some and the big island they're actually not allowed they can't introduce any new gmo crops on the island that aren't already growing there they're growing some papayas there that are gmo and they're allowing that to be grandfathered in but we just saw the whole the whole country of mexico has banned the growing of genetically modified corn mm -hmm. um, corn comes from mexico that's what's where our corn began and, and they discovered that uh gmo corn was was causing genetic pollution that the pollen was drifting and contaminating all the rest of the corn. So uh, they didn't want to lose the purity of their genetic stocks of corn. They have many different kinds of corn in Mexico. And what they were realizing was that within a short period of time, there might be no pure non-GMO corn left on the earth. This is a reality we face as well in the United States because when you have open air planting of genetically modified crops, it's gonna spread around. And eventually uh, we are gonna have a gene pool that's gonna be irreversibly altered this is something that will outlive nuclear waste. You know, life will go on reproducing in perpetuity. And we are changing the gene pool on planet Earth right now in a way that we can never reverse. Yeah, that, you know, just listening to you talk about that, I, I'm flashing back to a commercial when I was a kid of a Native American standing there with a piece of corn saying, You call it corn. We called it maize. We knew all about the goodness of maize, corn. Before America was America. And now I'm, I'm just picturing 
the, the same commercial, you know, you call it corn, we call it something that will cause genetic and autoimmune illnesses and all this pollution. We call it genetic pollution. It's, right. it's amazing. Do you, do you think that uh, the, are, are all the GMO uh, uh, products that are filtering through our society and through us, do you think that these really are a, a leading cause of disease from autoimmune disease to, uh, you know, autism? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, my kids, I have twins that are 13 years old and they have autism. So I'm very familiar with autism, which has increased fivefold in the last generation. And I don't know if my son's autism has been impacted by the presence of GMOs in the food supply or in their mother's diet when they were in the womb. But I'll tell you one thing, I think that a parent like me should have the right to make an informed choice. Mm -hmm. When I see that autism rates have increased fivefold in the generation since GMOs came into the food supply, when I see that rates of food allergies have been tripling in that same period of time, when I see that We've got uh, that a generation ago, 3% of the kids in America had a chronic illness, and today it's 24%. I start to wonder, is there a possible connection? And I do not know conclusively. I'm not going to go saying GMOs are causing every health problem known to man. But I'll tell you one thing. We should be able to make informed choices. And as a parent who would do anything for my kids, who loves them with all my heart and his heart is broken sometimes when I see the struggles they have to go through and how hard they have to work to learn the basic math problems that other kids can just learn really easily. My kids work so hard and they have to work three times as hard to do the same thing that a lot of other kids have come naturally to them. And they're troopers, you know, they're going for it and I want to make their life easier. And if I can help them eat foods that I think may be able to contribute to their thriving, you can be darn sure I want to do that. And when it comes to GMOs, I think I should have the right to make an informed choice about what I feed my kids, and labeling would help me do that. As the parent of two beautiful children with autism, do you think that has helped you uh, to grow spiritually? In uh, incredible ways. Yeah. You know, my grandfather started Baskin Robbins. My dad was this best selling author as I was growing up. I had this dreams of grandeur that I should be making this huge impact in the world. And I've, I've been pretty precocious and pretty successful so far. And my wife and I, uh, when we decided to become parents, we figured that our kids would probably be saving the world by the time they're out of diapers. <laughs> you know, we wanted to build on this legacy and imagine well, what's the next step in the Robbins lineage, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then we get kids who, uh, you know, we don't know if they'll be saving the world when they're out of diapers because they're still, they're still in them. But here's the thing, like they are precious, beautiful, magical, wonderful human beings who deserve complete and total love and respect, just like every other human being on this planet. And I have come face to face with the ways that I made my love for myself and my respect for other human beings in some ways conditional upon their performance, upon how successful they were, how much they accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I would drive myself to do more, to show the world that I'm somebody. And what, I, what my kids are teaching me is that everybody is somebody. And everybody deserves complete and total love. Everybody has massive gifts that they can give this world. And our gifts don't all show up in the same package. So my kids are my greatest teachers. And they have deepened my humanity. They've de deepened my passion for everybody. They've helped me break down this kind of belief that there are the special people and there's everyone else. To realize that we are all special and precious and magical and unique and beautiful. And I just think I'm a much better human being because of having River and Bodhi, that, that's my kids' names, uh, in my life. Yeah. Do you think River and Bodhi, uh, do, they, do they understand uh, what you're doing? I mean, are they proponents for non-GMOs and uh, the food revolution as well? Do they, do they look at things and make comments and say, Dad, look at that? Yeah. <laughs> they sure do. In fact, uh, some years ago, I was in the local natural food store with my son Bodhi, and they had a little bakery there. And we're walking by this aisle where they have some cookies uh, on display. And, and Bodhi's like uh, being a little cranky. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe I'll give him a cookie and that'll calm him down so I can finish my shopping. So I'm like, hey, Bodhi, here, why don't you have this? And I hand him this cookie. And he looks at it and he says, Is that, are those little pieces of candy on top? Because there's these little, little pieces of candy on there. I'm like, um, yeah. And he hands it right back to me. He says, don't you dare feed me junk food ever again. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Put them on the so, phone to my 15 year old daughter, please. Back, um, and here's the other thing, you know, we're, we're launched this boycott about uh, against Coca-Cola focusing on the natural brands they own, like Honest Tea and Adwala. That started with my son, River. I was in the store one day. I was hot and tired. My blood sugar was low. And I reached for this Adwala smoothie. And River stops me and says, why are you buying that? It's owned by Coca-Cola. And I say, uh, well, it's just a smoothie, River. That's and he's like, brilliant. do you want to give your money to Coca-Cola? That's brilliant. <laughs> so I stopped. I put that smoothie back. And a few, a few months later, we're thinking about how do we get to Coca-Cola? Like we, we, we know natural foods consumers don't buy a lot of Coke. Right. But we sure as heck buy a lot of honest tea in Adwala. Mm. And then I realized, you know, that's the weakness. Let's focus yeah. there. And my son tipped me off to our new campaign strategy. <laughs> so, so our boys are really passionate about it. And my son, River, actually was just telling me last night, he said, you know, I'm really proud of you for the work you're doing because you're helping make people healthier and you're helping make our world a better place. And I just started crying. I was like, River, that just means so much to me. Dude, you're going to make me cry. Seriously, that, that's gorgeous. Now, the GMO labeling campaign and the right to know uh, didn't have very much success in the state of Washington or California. Is, are you thinking, um, is there a movement to, get, to, to reintroduce this? What are the plans? 93% of the American public supports labeling of GMOs. This has been verified in poll after poll after poll. It's actually hard to get 93% of the American public to agree on much of anything. Um, but we have a very wide base of support for GMO labeling. What we saw in the states of Washington and California was that the initiative was put up before voters in those states. And initially, the polls showed 90% support for labeling. But then we had a massive spending drive led by the Grocery Manufacturers Association, Monsanto, the biotech industry. Generally, the average donation uh, to fight against these, the, this initiative was about a million dollars. Whereas on the, on the pro side, we had thousands and thousands and thousands of people making donations, but they were all small. And we wound up being outspent, um, you know, four to one maybe in each case. And there was this barrage of misleading and inaccurate advertisements, which didn't focus on your right to know. They didn't use the word GMO at all. They called it the false or misleading labeling bill. And they made it sound like labeling may be just fine, but this bill's bad, right? Yeah. And... So that was pretty much the focus. And then they said they made up a bunch of lies like that it was going to raise the price of food by several hundred dollars per family per year. Now, who's, who's going to want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And no, it was a lie. They, their data didn't come from economic analysis. It came from a PR firm that tried to come up with what number would scare people but sound plausible. And that's where that number came from. And then, and then they, they figured out some formulas for making it look that way. So anyway, we, 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 we lost 51% to 49% in both of those states. The uh, GMO companies and the junk food industry spent you know, more than $50 million securing that outcome. And now we have labeling initiatives popping up in 26 states around the United States. So mm -hmm. I think it's inevitable that we're going to see labeling initiatives somewhere pass in one state or another before long. And then the question is, ultimately, the battle is going to take place nationally. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you see often states have been the driving point for change, whether it's on gay marriage or, you know, mm -hmm. civil rights, the right to vote for women or African-Americans. A lot of issues marijuana. have been driven at the state level and eventually it goes to the federal. And then what happens? Right. Yeah. And that's where we're headed. Right. Unfortunately, we have a Congress that at this point, I think, is incapable of passing legislation that isn't approved by its donors. And the donors aren't the broccoli farmers and they aren't the organic foods industry, they're big agribusiness. And so in that sense, we have an uphill battle, but ultimately consumer demand is on our side. I'm just playing the devil's advocate here for a second. Like you mentioned, oh, well, they argue it's gonna send the price of food up. Well, if you wanna buy a hybrid car or an electric car, it's gonna cost you. If you wanna buy organic food and gluten-free food, it's usually more expensive. So isn't there a little bit of truth to that? I mean, if we're gonna eat non-GMO, the prices of food is gonna go up, right? Because it's, it's cheaper well, to make GMO foods. You know, an economic analysis done in Europe, uh, after they started, they mandated GMO labeling, which effectively led to the end of GMOs being sold in Europe because people wouldn't buy products that were labeled with GMOs, uh, led, concluded that the price of food didn't go up as a result of that. Now, food does cost more in Europe than in the U.S., but that's generally not considered the reason. There are a lot of other reasons, including that they pay their farm workers better. Yes, it is possible that we could see a small increase. 
uh, in, it, but but uh, the analysis, any analysis that's ever made it look really scary, assumed that consumers would not just go non-GMO. It assumed they would go all the way to organic. Number one, and number two, it's it's been filled with a lot of you know inflated ideas. A lot of what's brought down the price of food in America has been farming practices that have nothing to do with GMOs. It is widely considered that it might or might not raise the price a little bit, but right. ultimately not in a significant way. No, and if I could answer my own question and add to what you just said, the fact is uh, the more GMO foods we eat, the sicker we are, and then we end up spending more money anyway for healthcare. Uh, or, or down the road, our children. It, 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 it has societal effects that affect everything in our society. So it's, it's a chain reaction. Well, that's true with GMOs. I, it also is it's certainly true with junk food. Um, you know, it's very clear that drive throughs kill more people than drive-bys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> our junk food addiction in America is causing us enormous misery. Mm. You know, we may get short-term pleasure from certain foods that have been heavily marketed and advertised, but in the long term, how much pleasure is there in cancer? You know, how much pleasure, pleasure is there in being in chronic pain and having to take drugs just to survive? How much pleasure is there for guys who, who can't get an erection? You mm -hmm. know, because their, their circulation isn't flowing, right? You sold me right there. We could have probably just said that from the get-go and our, our male audience would have gone, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Could, could you share with us some uh, inspiring words to live by? I mean, you, you, basically for the past 20 minutes, you've given us a lot, but could you, could you um, go a little deeper? Yeah, I actually want to quote George Bernard Shaw because I think he pretty much nailed it. He, he said, this is the true joy in life to be used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, to be a force of nature instead of a feverish clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world won't devote itself to making you happy. He said, I'm a member of the community and I wanna do for it whatever I can before I die because life is no brief candle to me, it's more of a splendid torch and I wanna make it burn as brightly as possible before I hand it on to future generations. And so I think, you know, we have a choice. We can, we can be victims of the problems that happen and we have more than enough reason to despair and complain and bitch and moan for all eternity. But the reality is that's not gonna get us where we wanna go. So at some point in every human life, we reach the point where we say, you know what? I've got to become the author of my life. I've got to become the author of my destiny. I'm not just gonna be a product of what's happened to me. I'm gonna choose to make things better for my being on this planet. And when you do that, you start asking not why me and what, did, what went wrong, you start asking how can I be a part of the transformation? What can I do to be more happy, more fulfilled, more healthy, more alive? And the answers are abundant. Wow, words to live by. That was a whole show right there, just in that little clip. <laughs> so the name of our show is what matters most. And at the end of every show, we ask all of our guests, what is the legacy that you would like to leave which would inspire a better tomorrow? Uh, what matters most to you? And I'll tell you what, you know, you pretty much answer that question in this book, but how would you put it into a simple couple sentences? What matters most to me is love. Love is what gets me up in the morning. It's what fills my heart. It's what gives my life meaning. I don't just want to add years to my life. I want to add life to my years. And I am interested in how love can show up in a way that helps me to be congruent with my values. So that my life and my choices are an act of love for my body, my health, and my loved ones, and my planet. Gorgeous. I feel like, wow. yeah, that was beautiful, man. Uh, on that note, thank you very much, Ocean. Once again, uh, it was truly my pleasure to talk to you today. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's been great to be with you. Ocean Robbins, a man whose dream it is that we all live with unlimited compassion, unlimited cooperation, and unlimited possibilities. A man who feels that everything we do matters, reminding us all, once again, the simple things in life are what matter most. Namaste.
If you enjoyed our program, please share it. Become a partner. We welcome your support as we continue to create enlightening episodes and meaningful programming. For more details, check us out at whatmattersmostshow.tv and on Facebook slash Experience Nirvana. Namaste.